Well, as we are uh, virtually welcoming folks into this webinar series, I want to give you our official welcome to the series. So this is the first of three different webinars that um, we are going to be hosting between Hoover Institution, uh, Brown's Watson Institute, and MIT's uh, SSP program. And we're really excited because we're going to be talking about war games. The moderators of the series, uh, Dr. Reed Polly and Dr. Eric Lynn Greenberg, are my co-authors. Um, and what inspired the whole series was a work that we recently published in the European Journal of International Relations that talks about the use of wargaming for data collection, for looking at data, um, for thinking about how we um, put together policies, and then how we use social science to help inspire our war game design and analysis. So we hope you can join us for all three of the, the webinars. Um, this first one, we're gonna be focusing on wargaming as a historical tool, um, as an archive and as data. And our second series, which will be moderated by uh, Eric Lynn Greenberg, is gonna be looking more at kind of war game design and how social science um, approaches or can be used and when it comes to war game design and analysis. And then our final final of the series, um, I get to host, and it'll be with um, some of our great folks who have been working on these issues in national security, um, and we'll bridge the gap about how some of the lessons that we've taken from social science might be applied or not applied in how national security practitioners think about using war games. So. It's the beginning of a larger project for all of us. And so we're excited that you're here and hope that we're gonna have a really great conversation today. All right, over to you, Reed. Thanks, Jackie. We're really excited to be hosting this uh, Wargaming series. Um, and so I'm gonna start us off by taking just a few minutes to say a bit more about how we got into this, uh, why we're excited as political scientists to have these conversations both within and outside of our field. Uh, when we study international relations, uh, it is difficult to study rare phenomena, right? So in my case, uh, uh, for example, I'm interested in things like nuclear crises and escalation, right? And so you gotta get creative to think about how to generate data, uh, but this is difficult to do in the real world, right? Because we, even if we could, we might not want to experiment with national security in the real world. Uh, and so, so we have a great history of scholars turning to creative methods like survey experiments, uh, interviews, presenting hypothetical scenarios to, to solicit some responses from um, research subjects. And this has led to some really great work, uh, but we were noticing that there's a method that can do this better, that teaches us about how states, governments, and or just strategic actors behave in crises, and that's called wargaming. And so we think there's uh, four reasons to be very excited about using war games to study international politics or even in fields beyond the international arena. The first is that war games, uh, we think, are immersive tools, right? They are detailed simulations that have done well or engrossing players in their play, demanding time and energy, right, and concentration amongst its players. The second is that war games present players with consequences. If they screw up in the game, then they have to live with the choices they made and try to recover in later, later rounds of play. And so these consequences should focus the mind. A third reason to look to war games is that they can have highly representative samples, uh, right? When players uh, with real world experience and, tra and training are plausibly similar to those who might be making national security policy in the real world. And that is especially true of some of the historical games we're gonna talk about today. And fourth and finally, we think that war games can simulate group rather than just individual decision-making and deliberation, which is much more similar, uh, folks will tell you, been in the policy-making world to how policy is actually made deliberatively. So I hope you'll go to the article for more uh, about things like that and why we think a war game is, is so exciting. But I just wanna highlight uh, a reason that tees up the conversation for today of why we really think we're on solid ground here. And it's that this is not the first time that academics have come to the method of wargaming, right? Wargaming has made the leap from the military and policy community to academia before. And I 
uh, and, and have this near and dear to my heart because I got into the subject of studying uh, wargaming through the political military war games uh, that are available in the archives now, uh, both at MIT and in presidential archives uh, that were run by Thomas Schelling and Lincoln Bloomfield uh, in the late 50s and early 60s. And they were run um, partly at MIT and then, then transferred into the Pentagon to run in classified settings. Uh, but they were run by academics uh, who took their experience in Schelling's case, at, uh, it was at the Rand Corporation, and then brought it to the, to the academy to use the perspective of, of uh, political scientists to ask questions that they are interested in and use social scientific uh, design principles to design a new type of game that was useful for academics, right? And so the, the finding that I am most intrigued by in the, the archives that, that I have seen, right, is that even when it, these games went to the Pentagon and were run in classified settings, now declassified in game reports, um, that it was difficult to get any team to use nuclear weapons in these games, right? Even though there's simulations, but there were conflicts over West Berlin, Vietnam, uh, or other Cold War crises. Uh, and so even when war plans would have called for the use of nuclear weapons, it's surprising to see in the game um, folks not want to use nuclear weapons. And so I think we can use war games to study important questions about nuclear strategy, the nuclear taboo, crisis behavior, and escalation in general, and all with anonymized transcripts from senior officials making arguments and recommendations right in the room. All of that said, we're hoping that, that today our, our wonderful panelists uh, and at other sessions will critique that, right? And uh, deliver their own uh, uh, research and, and, and um, help us to think about this even better in a cross-disciplinary conversation about wargaming. And so we've got three terrific guests today. We're gonna help us do that. Uh, we wanna highlight their research and, and dig into it in our, in our discussion. So, we're very pleased to welcome uh, Dr. John Emery, who's joined us from the Department of International and Area Studies at the University of Oklahoma. And after he speaks, we're gonna turn to Dr. John Scott Logel, who is a professor in the Wargaming Department at the US Naval War College. And then uh, Dr. Elizabeth Bartels is joining us from the RAND Corporation, where she is the current co-director of RAND's Center for Gaming. So we're very excited to hear all about your research. So I'm gonna turn the floor over first to Dr. John Emery to take us away. Thank you so much, Reed. So I came to war gaming in a pretty roundabout way. I was working on contemporary issues of technology, ethics of war, things like drones, algorithms, AI, all the hot topics of the day. And I kept coming into a bit of a dilemma when we're thinking about this kind of unknown future of war, right? We're trying to project a future that may not never occur. Right? And so how do you think through that? And of course, I turn to history and the historical record to try and understand that. And so where else would I go than the Rand Corporation archives in Santa Monica, California? The place of Cold War knowledge production, the origins of deterrence theory, rational choice, and early systems analysis. And I ended up finding something interesting in the mid-1950s, the origins of political military gaming that ultimately led into Reed Pauley's uh, political military games at MIT. And seeing how these games played out there and trying to understand the dilemmas that were present in the Cold War, right? The invention of nuclear weapons, nuclear brinksmanship, something that thankfully we have no empirical record for, right? You still have to think through what may happen in a possible future of war. And so at RAND, they did this in something known as the Cold War game, where they sought to integrate politics and economics into traditional war gaming. They wanted to really, truly understand the deep dilemmas of political decision making under the uncertainty of, nucle of the nuclear era and mutually assured destruction. And so I went in, I'll admit, with a bit of a caricatured view of the Rand Corporation, right? I thought I was going to go in and see a bunch of old white guys talking about killing millions of people without any qualms and casually discussing incinerating tens of millions. But what I found wasn't groupthink, but on the other hand, just a huge contestation, especially between the mathematical analytics division and the social science division at Rand in the mid-1950s. 
And this played out in two competing Cold War games that they each made uh, to try and understand the world. So the Mathematical Analytics Division sought to integrate politics and economics in order to test US strategies in the Cold War to ultimately be able to predict the future and give policy guidance for the best US strategies. The Social Science Division, on the other hand, thought that the mathematicians were getting a little bit too far on their turf, talking about politics and social science. And they decided to make a spike game, also called the Cold War game, where they wanted to really look at the insights of judgment, of group dynamics, of the psychology, and really truly understand the unique culture and character of the Soviet Union, of the European allies of the United States and the United States itself in order to better understand and exercise judgment in the face of the horrors of nuclear war. And so what I found uh, in my paper that was published in Texas National Security Review on this was that the Mathematical Analytics Division was very quick to use nuclear weapons multiple times. Right? Whereas the social science division, on the other hand, very much had a lot of nuclear restraint. Right, They were very hesitant to press the button. So something that Reed found in his games as well were also there in the original political military games at the Rand Corporation. And so thinking through all of the dilemmas that they were faced with and an unknown future of war, um, I think it's useful to think about five key insights that I gained from the archives there. And so the first one in the core of my argument in that paper is that the level of abstraction you have in war games matters, right? That's not going to be, that's not going to be a surprise to anyone here who's been involved in war gaming, right? Sometimes abstraction is very useful, but what I found in the social science game is that realism leads to an emotional engagement with the players, right? And I argued that it engages their ethical intuitions in a way that kind of more abstract games may not do, right? I found in that game, a lot of players, even that advocated bold policies in their writings and things like that, were very hesitant to cross that nuclear threshold, uh, even within a game simulated environment. And I think the second lesson I learned from this, which may be controversial, is that war games are a tool for understanding human judgment rather than prediction, right? I think war games as prediction really just comes down to the game design, the rules that you set, and the assumptions that you make. And that can drive outcomes whichever way the war game designer wants to drive them, right? So it may not be the best tool for predicting the future of the social world or for predicting recommendations for policymakers, but it can tell you a lot about human judgment and group dynamics. The third lesson I take away is taking seriously conditions of uncertainty especially when we're looking back historically, we tend to kind of read history backwards. We know the outcomes, right? And so we tend to view inevitability where there's contingency. So one of the most profound uh, impacts I had in the archives was how, how the social scientists grappled with these conditions of uncertainty. So I'm just gonna pull a couple quotes. One from Joseph Goldson. He says, no government is absolutely free to impose its will upon the world. All operate under some constraints. All must operate with incomplete information about the present and the future, and all must expect the unexpected to interfere with the best laid plans. World political history is replete with examples of Pyrrhic victories, and conversely with situations thought to be defeats at the time, which turned out to be blessings in disguise how to allow for such considerations in evaluating real or game simulated political developments is a formidable problem indeed, right? The conditions of uncertainty, the contingency of history and the endless possibilities of the social world really were a weight that these social scientists at Rand were trying to grapple with in the mid 1950s. Another social scientist at the time noted, quote, there are gaps in our knowledge of enemy equipment and tactics. There are wide variations in observed results with our own forces. There are fluctuating factors like weather involved and the situations under study that have no real peacetime precedent. In the end, because of this, we think it's wrong to go into great detail on one factor, only to multiply it by another that is so vague that philosophers debate whether it could be rightly called a probability. 
In fact, we're coming to the opinion that too much emphasis is placed on the numerical outputs of broad system studies, measures like total bombers shot down, cities destroyed, total bombs on target, and so on, end quote. Right, so you see they're already grappling with what we didn't come to terms with in the Vietnam War with the Vietnam body count problem, right? If you get too much quantitative driven numbers, it may tell you that you should have won the war three years ago as it's still kind of going on and on. So taking conditions of uncertainty seriously. The fourth uh, is that we need to look back to the future. Right, And so one way we do that is looking back to the past in the historical record and understand what assumptions they made about the future. Right, Then we can test those assumptions against the empirical record. And what the social scientists then found to kind of push back against the mathematics division is that the mathematicians were kind of mirror imaging the Soviet Union. Right, They were assuming the Soviet Union either act like an evil caricature or like the US would act in a lot of ways. Right? So there's a real importance of having area studies experts to play or red team, if you will. So that's one of the big takeaways that I think all of us can try and apply as much as possible is bring in historians, bring in area studies experts into our war games as much as possible. And the fifth one is really focus on the silences of the archives as much as what is there. Right? So both in Reed's work and my work, there's no direct discussion of ethics or these kind of ethical dilemmas, right? We don't get that in the early Cold War period. It's just kind of the fear and anxiety of an all out nuclear war, right? And so these, there's some good evidence that these were kind of relegated to private thoughts. And what we find across both of our games at Rand and MIT is that they take a huge emotional toll on the players. Right? Having that high level of realism leads to a real engagement. And Lincoln Bloomfield famously stated that coming out from the game is often like waking up from a particularly vivid dream. Right? It takes days for the, for the feeling of the game to wear off. And I think that has an important impact when we're thinking about understanding human decision making and group dynamics that it's not just reason and emotion as a dichotomy, right? This isn't the idealized Cartesian world, but reason and emotion are always already intersecting and overlapping. So understanding the kind of logical sequence along with the emotion that goes into the weight of decision making is essential. And so finally, that leads me to a few limitations of the archival method. Right, so often we're working with incomplete information. Right, when I first went into the RAND archives, I didn't know that there were two different Cold War games, one original one and a spite game, because they all called it the Cold War game. Thankfully, historian Daniel Bessner kind of helped me tease that out. And we really laid out kind of clearly which game is a social science game, which game is a mathematical game. So that's one risk that you run. Um, the second limitation is, while it tells you a lot about that particular moment in time, it may not be universally applicable or relevant to today, right? So understand it through the lens of what was going on at that moment as much as possible. There's always a danger and that we're reading in what we want to see. We need to understand our own positionality as researchers and use the best historical and interpretivist methods that we can in order to avoid that. And finally, getting back to my fifth uh, key insight, the silences of the archives, right? I think there's an importance to have a judicious and interpretive hand to draw out the complexities of the silences in the archives, to understand as much about what is present and what is absent. And that tells us something about what the dominant discourses were in that snapshot moment of time, right? And so the immense challenge then is to preserve the kind of indeterminate and mysterious character of the war game that you're getting into in the archives, while simultaneously to step around their paradoxes while creatively revealing what is present in absence. So thinking through as much about what is missing from the archives as what is there. So I'll go ahead and leave it there. Absolutely fantastic, thank you. I uh, commend to everybody to check out uh, Dr. John Emery's article in the Texas National Security Review. Uh, let's go now to Dr. John Scott Logel, and I believe he's going to share. Uh, y yes, I am. Slides, share some slides. Let's see, let's see if I can make this work here. Okay, and I assume everyone can see that. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, John Scott Logel from uh, the War Gaming Department in Newport. Um, I have to give the obligatory disclaimer: the views here are 
mine alone and not do not reflect official policy or position of the War College, the Navy, or the Department of Defense. Uh, I want to thank Jackie and Reed for inviting me today. Um, briefly, what I want to do is uh, discuss how we understand war games and how I understand them within the context of the work I do. Uh, and then I'll look at uh, two historical case studies uh, that I've, I'm looking at personally to, uh, in my work to help understand uh, the work we do for, for the Navy. Um, looking at uh, what a war game is, um, the definition that, that we've generated and thinking about, we go back to McCarty Little uh, in 1887, uh, where he just simply called it artificial war, right? So it's simulated, it's uh, joint pub, one tells us that it involves two or more opposing forces that have rules, data, procedures um, that depict an actual or assumed real life situation. Uh, and of course, when I got to the, the department uh, 12 years ago, they handed me Peter Perla. Uh, and this was a definition uh, that I started with. A warfare model or simulation uh, does not involve the operations of actual forces. Um, but more importantly, those events are affected or could be affected by decisions uh, by players on opposing sides. Uh, so where that leads us and what we use now is what Frank McHugh came up with in his 1966 book, Fundamentals of Wargaming. McHugh worked over four decades in the Wargaming department. And he puts it, a war game is a simulation of selected aspects of a conflict situation uh, in accordance with predetermined rules, data, and procedures uh, that provide decision-making experiences and provide decision-making information. And most importantly, that is applicable to real-world situations. Uh, they're not mutually exclusive, the decision-making experience or the decision-making information, left side being uh, the experiential side of the war game, the right side being uh, the analytic side. Uh, we th I think, and we think they're interrelated. If you go to the uh, Kinevin framework for decision making, uh, where order on the left is apparent, ranging to on the right, I'm sorry, order on the left where it goes, order is not apparent, to the right where order is apparent. Uh, this order is in there from uh, complex in the upper left hand side to complicated to simple to chaotic. Uh, what wargaming enables us to do is to understand these complex problems. We're, we don't really understand the cause and effect relationships in, in advance, um, but when you experience them and see the events unfold, you can begin to understand how they come about or might come about. So wargaming as a learning tool uh, is first and foremost how we think about it in, in the department, right? We're organizing uh, the what, the information uh, that transforms into understanding, right? And you have to explain the how and why. In a war game, uh, the events unfold before the eyes of the players and the participants. Um, and then you get to, to explore uh, what you didn't know and maybe why you didn't know. Uh, and so it becomes uh, a, an exercise in discovery learning. And as was highlighted by the earlier speaker, John, uh, Dr. Emery, um, the caveats are to, to war gaming, it's, better at illuminating issues than proving anything uh, or proving the validity of a concept or course of action. Um, and what you'll find in, in all war games, uh, it's highly dependent on the going and assumptions that are built into the data uh, and the rules and the procedures that are put into to building the game. It's, it's a, in shorthand, it's, it's context matters, right? When you look at a war game, you need to understand why they played the game. What was the purpose of that war game? You need to understand how they played that game. What were the rules? What was the construct? Uh, was it two-sided? Was it multi-sided? Um, how did they build the game to, to build the purpose for why they were playing it? And most importantly, uh, you need to understand who played the game. Were these subject matter experts? Were these actual decision makers? Could they be students trying to understand or, or be or the objective of learning uh, how to do warfare or go through a, a diplomacy simulation. Um, and so thinking along the, the idea of context, um, when you do uh, a, a, a tour in, in the Wargaming Department, someone will, will always bring up the Nimitz quote. Uh, and Admiral Nimitz came back to the college in 1960 and in 1961, uh, and he basically made the, the same, uh, same pitch, right? And this becomes abbreviated to, uh, 
the war with Japan had been enacted in the game rooms by the War College by so many people in so many different ways that nothing had happened during the war was a surprise. Absolutely nothing except the kamikaze tactics toward the end of the war. We had not visualized these. Um, and then in a letter in, in, in 1965, again, supporting uh, the PNWC, uh, looking for some language to help understand the meaning of the war games and, and the interwar college, uh, he reflected that the courses were so thorough that after the start of World War II, nothing that happened in the Pacific was strange or unexpected. Well, in shorthand, uh, in 2016, uh, CNO Admiral Richardson came to the War Game Department and said, yeah, just run the game a bunch of times, do a bunch of iterations and figure out how to, how, how to defeat Red. And we said, what do you mean? He goes, well, just like they did it with Nimitz in World War II. Uh, and in that vein, with this perception of what happened in the past is directly affecting what we're supposed to do today. Uh, we went back to the archives, uh, my colleagues and I, Peter Pellegrino has, has worked extensively in this area. Uh, thus, I'm stealing his slides or using his slides. Um, to explain this portion because what really happened in this you know, war period was uh, roughly 318 games. Uh, when you look at Mike Vallejos' um, annex in his uh, Blue Sword book, you get an understanding of the various games that they played between 1919 and 1941. Some were big strategy games, some were tactical games, some were quick decision games. But the reality was it wasn't figuring out how to beat Japan, it was to create the habit of mind. So when you, the, the students who played the game for education and understanding of how to do naval warfare, uh, they could use the tools and the operational environment and adapt it in, in the actual war. Uh, so it wasn't about beating Japan because nowhere in the war games did they talk about coalition warfare. Did they talk about uh, the atom bomb? This was not thought of, right? So uh, it was the habit of mind and learning how to go through the planning process uh, that they were able to do during the war. But there was a call for analysis and for looking at historical data. In 1932, Admiral Harris Lanning comes into the college and he's the president and he says, I'm gonna create a research department. And he calls on this guy, Captain Willer Van Auken. He says, you know, we've been doing this blue orange operational game where the US Navy has been fighting the Japanese Navy since 1927. What have we learned? So now they're, changing the purpose of the game to go from an experiential game to turn it into analysis and trying to figure out what can we learn from this. And so um, Captain Van Auken and his team of three other officers went through the report and they came up with the, what they called the Van Auken Report in May of 1933. Uh, and it was a collection and observations of, of in detail the 1933 war game, famously uh, uh, the blue lead there was Admiral uh, King and they came up with a chart, a table. And if you look at this blueprint, it's, they had these sheets and they looked at each game uh, in this abstract from 1927, 1928, 1929, 30, 31, 32, into 33. And they highlighted uh, in columns, some of it would be done with a spreadsheet today, uh, what was in the orange force that would be the Japanese, what was in the blue order of battle, which route did they choose to take? Uh, and what they came up with uh, was, Re recommendations that Admiral Lanning wanted to share with OPNAV uh, specifically about the treaty fleet, uh, the treaty Navy, uh, which what they were trying to work with. And so here, uh, I, just to highlight the example of what was damaged and then to the, to the right, you can see uh, that last column there, the islands used by orange, right? Geography never changes. Uh, this is the, the terrain and geography that uh, Pacific uh, strategists in the Indo-Pacific think about today. Um, but specifically, they did look at uh, the use of air power and, and the air instrument. Um, and during these games, I highlighted in, in the Van Auken report how uh, Admiral King used his air forces for scouting and keeping the submarines was noteworthy. That he's reflecting on the gameplay. This goes. This was in the report they sent forward. Um, and they noted uh, the experience that uh, that he had prior to the game, that he had been the commander of uh, the Lexington and the Saratoga prior to coming in, and how they used the air instrument, the air forces uh, in the game and reflected that use. Uh, so again, it goes back to what happened with this. Um, in the grand scheme of things, it was just a data point for the interwar service, interwar Navy to make, uh, to make some decisions.
which leads me to the Naval Enterprise. Um, and if you're interested in getting into this period, you have to understand where the information went. Uh, and so out on the, the margins down the left side uh, of the slide, you can see Edward Miller's War Plan Orange, Al Noffy's to train the fleet for war to talk about the fleet exercises. Norm Friedman recently uh, did his history of the interwar period at the War College with uh, his book, Winning the Future War. Uh, John Kuhn's book, Agents Innovation, really uh, shows the connection uh, that you see here between this, this what is a early version of what, I, what Peter Perlow would call the cycle of research, right? From the War College, the reports would go up to OPNAV uh, and then into the plans division, and they would come up with ideas to test in the, the fleet problems that would go out to the fleet. Um, and then the graduates from the college who were the best and brightest would go both to the fleet and to the war plans division. Uh, that ultimately would end up writing the, the rainbow plans for the war, All right? So thinking about this period, we understand the games were initially for education, for naval officers, taking that data, then they extrapolated it and used it to help make uh, form resourcing decisions and for structure decisions. Let's fast forward now to the 1980s where I'm currently looking uh, because uh, the college as of late has been, been hosting strategic games and global force management games. Uh, and you go back to the global war years, these, uh, these histories um, the, and the Newport papers are free at our website. Um, why did they play the games, uh, the global war games between 79 and 88? Well, it was to examine the maritime strategy. And by 82, it became a way to examine the 600 ship fleet that John Lehman wanted to use to fight the Soviets. Um, how do they play the game? Initially, it started as an operational game. Uh, and then uh, it became uh, used for uh, socializing among the con congressional members uh, and policy leaders. Uh, so they turned into three week extravaganzas uh, with each week being a little bit different. Um, and I will leave you with uh, the strategy to what did they take from these? Um, they took uh, in the, from the, the history of the, the second global war series, you can see that uh, they deducted that the war would be non-nuclear. They deducted that the, the protracted war uh, with sequential rollback operations would have to be planned. Uh, they figured out where sea control could be stressed. Um, and then uh, they realized in these games that war termination leverage was gonna have to be figured out to keep it conventional and from going to, to nuclear means. Uh, and last, lastly, they, they figured out sea control was going to have to be emphasized uh, for the US in order to mobilize economically uh, in such an event. So um, two case studies, two ways to think about it. Um, the, the best thing I can tell you is uh, if you're interested in this era, the archives are currently offsite right now as they renovate here in Newport. Um, but if you have a secret classification, you can get to the classified library and look at these game reports here in, uh, for, for these games here in Newport. Um, and I think I'm at the end of my time. Yeah, terrific. Uh, thank you. That's very exciting. Um, I look forward to following up on a couple of those points. Uh, uh, I'm here in Rhode Island and uh, interested in getting down to those archives myself. Uh, thank you very much, John Scott. Uh, next, we're going to turn to Dr. Ellie Bartels. Please, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks, Reid. Um, so I'm going to pick up on some of the comments that were made um, by both John and John Scott to try to tease out a little bit about what we know about sort of what is that silence of the archives? What are general types of bias um, that we should be on the lookout for when, when we're doing this sort of work? And so um, it's maybe helpful to start with where I came in. Um, I, I started doing archival work after I had spent about a decade as a game designer. And so I ended up um, in the Rand Archive, um, in Newport's archive, um, you know, coming into it as, as a game designer who had worked for government, um, doing my dissertation research. And it was really informative to me to see where some of the gaps and seams and patterns of missing information were. And so I'm going to talk just a little bit about um, some of where I think we, we sort of expect to see um, things that we should be sensitive to um, that may not be apparent from the archival materials in and of themselves. Um, so, you know, first, I think it's uh, useful to think about the distinction between when is it that we're interested in the game design itself versus when are we interested in the path of game play. Um, both speakers have teased out issues that relate to both of those things. 
Um, and I think John in particular highlighted the fact that often um, the game design is a really important place where assumptions get smuggled in. What then becomes really interesting is if you start looking through these archival data, much more of the focus is on documenting game play than it is on documenting the game design itself. And so just from the get-go, um, the place where we probably have the strongest um, levers being pulled that are shaping what the, the consequences of the game are, are often um, the least directly documented. Um, if we're lucky, we'll sort of have the gameplay process and we might have some of the gameplay artifacts. So for example, um, lists of forces that were involved or rules that were used to help adjudicate. But it's pretty rare that we actually have um, the complete totality of the game design materials and even more rare that we have what in some ways we actually really want, which is the decision-making process of the game's designer that documents why they made a decision um, to use these forces and not those forces, to print the map this way and not that way. As a designer, I know that those choices are often highly conditional. Um, I've got to run a game on a particular timeline at a particular price point um, for a particular set of research objectives. And so I'm making hundreds of these small assumptions in how I'm designing the game um, that are often not well documented at all. And so um, those may be places where the archive is particularly likely to be silent. In some cases, um, we can supplement that with things like interviews with living designers. Um, but in some cases, those are just going to be gaps in the record. And we've got to make um, some, some good, good guesses about what types of contextual pressure um, and what types of assumptions were being made by designers that shaped the game um, in the way we end up seeing the, the limited products that come down to us. We can also think about some of those same types of gaps that exist when we think about what's documented out of, of um, sort of gameplay. Um, there's a range of structural considerations here that really do shape what type of information was collected at the time of gameplay um, that we can start thinking about. So one of those, and I think the one that we sort of think about um, most frequently is the classification of the game environment often shapes the technologies that are available um, to capture game records. And so different, um, different points in history will have different um, types of data recording processes that were possible. You know, is, um, was there note taking in the game? Was there a full um, you know, audio recording, which we have for some of the Cold War games? Is there video recording, which we do have in some rare cases? Um, or much more likely, are we dealing with sort of the scribbled notes of some uh, poor beleaguered researcher who's sitting on the sidelines of the game um, where we're getting a much more imperfect record of gameplay. And in many cases, we have none of those extant materials from game play. What instead we have is the after action reporting that is the complete analytic product. So we don't have those raw data sources um, that can be really valuable. There's also places where we're gonna have gaps in our record um, because of concerns about um, data documentation and privacy. Um, interestingly, this is a place where in some ways there's more restrictions on more recent documentation. So things like, um, you know, institutional review boards that are trying very hard to make sure that we respect human subject protections often mean that we are incentivized to limit the types of data that we're collecting about our players in order to make sure that we're not posing additional risks. Um, as, a, as a researcher, I fully understand and support why we do that. Um, as someone who's been going into the archives and wishing that we had some of the biographical details that, for example, Reed is able to pull um, out of those games from the 50s and the 60s, where we do have um, much more detail about who played, what their career looked like, what their other statements about these topics were. Um, I do sort of regret some of those gaps and scenes that we see um, in those auxiliary materials. So those are all um, sort of from get-go, big places that we're likely to have gaps and scenes. We're not very likely to have detailed game design notes. We're not very likely to have um, good records of what the game's uh, design and mechanics were in its final form. Um, and we're likely to have some big gaps in terms of how much information we have about the conduct of the game itself. So what we do tend to have, um, and what has been shown by several of the speakers already, is the after action reports that's written of the, out, out of the game as the analytic product. Um, and here, I think what's really important to be thinking about is that these are documents that are designed to meet a particular purpose, right? You aren't writing a report um, sort of abstractly to try to document what you're doing. You're trying to answer a particular, you know, in the context of these, um, 
these games that are either run for the Pentagon or the Navy, and we can take lots of other examples. There's a specific person who has a question, whether um, that's on the research end where they're actively trying to understand a, a war betting phenomena in the game research, or like some of the games that were run um, in the interwar years where they're educational and we're trying to think about how do we train up the next generation of officers. And so the reporting is very much designed to answer those key objectives and to answer the mail for that. Um, so what does that mean? Um, we're likely to try to write in all the ways that we recommend that we write when we're trying to get current modern day um, policymaker attention. So um, we're likely to be light on our the methodological details um, because it's unlikely that the decision maker really cares about the nuts and bolts, um, but that means we have big gaps in the game design. We're not likely to spend a lot of time in extensive discursive detail about the flow of how the game unfolded because these are busy people and we're trying to be short and concise. And that leaves some of the, the nuance and details um, that you know, John and John Scott are, are talking about being able to mine out of some of these older games. Um, you know, when we're writing for decision makers, those do tend to be more concise and they may not have all of that detail. They're gonna have a much more synthesized product. What that means in effect is that you're getting the biases of the analysts on one hand, and on the other hand, um, the desires of the sponsor. What was the sponsor interested in? And that's those contextual details are going to dramatically shape how those reports are written. That's important to keep in mind when we're looking at one specific example. It's even more important to think about when we're trying to combine data across many games, right? Because the chances that the incentive structures that are put on both the game designer, the game sponsor, the game players are going to be consistent between um, games that are run by different organizations that are run years apart, um, that are run uh, intentionally to look at a wide range of different topics are going to be very different. And so, you know, if we take John Scott's example of looking at the games that were run in the interwar years, you know, we can't treat those 318 games as if they were all designed for the same purpose by the same person and had interchangeable assumptions. But we may not have good documentation about why assumptions varied between games or even explicitly statements of what assumptions vary. And so that makes the cross game comparisons that I think in some ways are some of the methodologically richest and most interesting areas to be able to tease out this larger data set, um, a challenging archival process um, to try to, to think about. Um, so, so when we think about those reports, I think it's really important to be trying to uncover what the context the report was written for. What was the sponsor? What was the decision-making process that they were trying to inform? Um, what were the sort of uh, broader contextual factors going on in the um, wider bureaucratic process that generated the report? I think that can help us be a little bit more sensitive to some of those um, unspoken assumptions or some of those silences that we might not otherwise be able to identify. Um, two last points that I want to mention um, because they inevitably end up shaping what we have available to us. Um, so the first is, um, what are incentives for uh, releasing game materials to the public? Um, these are gonna be different depending on who generated the game, how old it is, what context it is. Um, some big ones that we can think about though, right off the bat, um, the classification of archives is going to vary considerably. Um, there are, um, you know, even if we just look at, at Reed's work, um, some of that work was available through the presidential libraries. Some of it was available through other archives that were pulling in resources. And so he had to do a lot of work triangulating across multiple locations that had opened up materials. Um, my guess is if we had the total set of available games to run, we're only seeing some small portion that was accessible from the outside. And I think one thing, um, that maybe we can talk about in, in later sort of cross panel discussion is some of the efforts that are going on right now across the gaming community to try to make one another aware of where there are these types of resources, what the terms and conditions of accessing them are um, and how we can make them available. I know, you know in Rand's case, um, we have an amazing archivist who's done a lot of work to try to make these materials more accessible to researchers, um, including John and myself. Um, there's a lot of work across the community being done in that space. And I think we don't always have good visibility about what the current state of play is. Um, and so that might be a place where the community can come together um, and, and keep working. And with that comes sort of, what's the incentive for keeping these materials, right? Um, we have very, you know, like any archive, um, the archives of gaming materials that exist are largely, you know, 
there's a lot of contingencies about what was kept and why it was kept. And so having some, some understanding of um, whose archives are available, why those archives are available, and how they differ from institutions that we might not have the sort of equivalent records for. Um, does that mean that that organization um, wasn't gaming? Were they gaming in a different way and that just didn't incentivize um, keeping the records in the same way? Or is it just pure historical luck that we have archives from some locations and not others? And so again, thinking about where, where those silences are at an institutional level um, and how they bias the story we're gonna be able to tell about the history of games um, or the history of any particular topic where we're leveraging games, um, I think is really important for being able to make sure that we're using these resources in a smart way going forward. Um, the one thing I just wanna close with is a couple of words about sort of lessons learned for, for people like John Scott and myself who still do run games. I think one of the things that digging in the archives does is give you a real appreciation for what is uh, in your game reporting and what's not in your game reporting. Um, and so I think one thing, another place where we could have a useful conversation sort of cutting across all of our experiences is, um, you know, what are, what are those kind of key, key ways of documenting the assumptions that we're making when we do game designs? Um, and how do we make those assumptions as accessible to outsiders as possible? Um, as we're starting to get more games published um, in academic journal articles, you can think about um, some of the work that the organizers have done in this space, um, or as you know, we're working for government organizations, but trying to think um, to, to the longer term about making these more useful for cross-game comparison and cross-game analysis um, from different organizations. You know, we don't have shared standards for what what you know what are the five things that should be in every game report. And there's a lot of diversity if you start looking across current reporting. And so I think there's more we can be doing um, to try to, to um, create some standards across the field. And this is a place where um, I've learned a lot looking at modeling and simulation, which has some of the same problems about the difficulty of documenting assumptions and the complexities of the system that your, your docu you know, exhaustive documentation is sort of an unwieldy beast. So thinking about how we do um, smart minimalist documentation that still allows for good comparison, I think is something that the field could really uh, benefit from more time and attention on. So with that, Reed, I think back over to you for Q&A. Fantastic. I think we should pick up exactly right there. Thank you, Ellie. Uh, to, to go to John and John Scott to just uh, reflect a little bit on this, this idea of what we can do, if it's possible, to improve transparency of what in, in our paper, Jackie and, and Eric and I are calling this uh, a distinction between raw and processed data. So if you go to an archive, you can sort of tell immediately, or what strikes you immediately is the difference between you know, the processed output that says, here's the game we ran in a report summarizing you know, the, the conclusions. Um, versus what's much more exciting to the scholar and researcher is to find the, the raw data that says, you know, um, what assumptions should we make in this game? Something about the design and inputs, um, although you're absolutely correct, right? I, I think it's rare to come across somebody um, talking about their assumptions unless you get uh, the game director like a shelling writing about it in a later uh, article, right? Because he's got incentives to also publish these peer-reviewed articles that say, this is what I was trying to do with my game design and how I did it. But that is uncommon. So, so um, let's, let's turn that question over to John and John Scott to say, in John Scott's case, right, is this even possible in the Naval War College setting? Because you mentioned, you know, you need a clearance to even go to see some of this material, which is crazy to some of us because it's from the 1930s. But uh, uh, is it possible, do you think, to improve transparency um, for a researcher, even if it's going to be 30 years from now? And in John's case, how are you, as a scholar, able to, to do this at the RAND archives? How, what was that, even just practicalities of that process of communicating with archivists uh, and getting access to these documents, um, whether raw or processed? Um, John Scott, do you want to start with you? Sure. Uh it's, it's a problem we deal with now because uh, we've been trying across the DOD, I, I think Ellie's been associated with and Jackie, I'm sure has seen this, you know, with, uh, with Robert Works 2015 uh, guidance, but they set up a uh, archive, a, re a repository at, at, uh, at the Pentagon, and then each service is supposed to feed this data source, right? So, so you take raw data and then you have to organize it and 
under what form do you want to collect it? So that is that is one problem set. Um, I will correct uh, the 1930s games are available. Uh, what is not available are the not, not all of the 1980s games. Um, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Thanks. So yeah. So you can go back and and that's why I live in 1919, 1941 for a lot of my research because it helps me not worry about uh, disclosure um, and and re relying too much. Um, the other piece to think about um, with when you think about the assumptions, which you what we've really paid attention to in the reporting that we've done here is we do call out the assumptions because the assumption assumptions will bound the game and that's why I, I say context matters. Jackie will know that, you know, some of the games we play, if there is a decision to use a nuclear deterrent or a nuclear option, we will bound the game there because we did not invite the subject matter expertise to work through that problem set. We note where the players got to that point and we continue the game, say, Roger, you did not do that. Let's move forward. On our strategic deterrence games, we build that. To, and it's again, and sometimes the players are told, uh, we want you to use the nuclear option in this game. And so Sometimes they're told, see where you go with it. It all depends on how you start the game. So the assumptions really matter uh, for getting that material. And lastly, um, the database, uh, the data science, we, we are struggling with that right now. Of We have data on databases on four different networks, four different classifications. How do you bring that together? Is there a way to, to mine that and use that usefully to, to, to use AI or some machine learning uh, to draw across those? Uh, so that is a... Uh, um, it's an ongoing struggle. So that's why I'm, I'm participating because I want to see what you all come up with because we're looking for ideas as well. That's great. It's a struggle, but also an opportunity. Uh, that's really exciting. Um, uh, let's go to John next. And, and let me just give a reminder to our audience to please post their questions in the Q&A because I'll start reading those out shortly. John, the floor is yours. Yeah, I think Ellie made so many fantastic points in there. And I think why I was so drawn to this particular Cold War game when I kind of got in there and started exploring is because we got a lot of the why, because you got to see the mathematical analytics division kind of tease things out. And they were debating with the heads of the systems research laboratory. Do you want to have a chip and peg board? Do you want to do something else? And you can kind of see the back and forth between them. Uh, saying that we don't want to do this because then it'll be just a game, but then we want to do this. So you can kind of see that dynamic going on. And especially once you get to the social scientist game, because they're responding directly to something. So they're kind of critiquing game designs and assumptions as they go through. Like for one example, they played four iterations of the social science game and the fourth one was the most robust. But in the first round, they started realizing that news events were creeping in to the kind of play. So they decided by the fourth round to project this two years into the future so that, you know, kind of big events that were going on the news wouldn't come into the game, right? So kind of all those things made it for a really rich and engaging uh, game. But, you know, like uh, Ellie was saying, having a great archivist is absolutely fantastic. And Kara McCormick at RAND is the best I've ever encountered. That's not always the case at all of the archives, right? Some are not as well funded and some it's, you know, more volunteer basis too. So, uh, but the process of actually getting there was really fantastic. And she works with you to get you access to RAND and um, spend as much time as you need there. And you can give them key kind of search words and things like that, and they can pull boxes for you. So really building that relationship with your archivist is, is the number one <laughs> thing that you can do. Archivists are the best. Um, let me uh, do two things here. Uh, I want to bring in Jackie uh, just to talk about um, her experience in trying to publish some of this raw data, right? She has published uh, uh, a game, really, right? Game design ideas. And so um, uh, I want to do that, but also ask Ellie to talk more about this Bob Work memo that um, uh, was, was brought up. Uh, by the way, um, uh, Bob Work will be here in our final uh, webinar series, uh, and we can ask him uh, this as well then. But, but Ellie, do you have any reflections on, um, you know, how, how successful that call for the creation of a repository has been to share data or, or lessons learned from how we can do it better next time? Thanks. Uh, yeah, I can say a little bit about that. Um, 
There's been, uh, Defense One over the years has put out a couple of articles that have had updates on um, the repository that have been written by folks directly involved with it. So if you're interested, you can get some sense in the open press reporting about what's there. Um, on one hand, it's a, it's a really substantial repository. I, you know, at least it was 700 plus a number of years ago. So it's gotta be north of a thousand by now, I would guess. Um, but I don't know that for sure. Um, I think what, what has been really useful is having that forcing function to say there is one place where these materials can live. But I think what you really start to see very quickly when you start digging into it is that there's a ton of diversity in terms of how people report out their games, what gets loaded into the archives. And as you start um, talking to people, the reasons for that diversity are not consistent. It's not like there's sort of one set of incentives that drives you towards you know, a longer report versus a shorter report. And so I think coming in as an outsider, you know, just recognizing you're gonna see a lot of, of differences um, and it may not always be clear why you're seeing the distinctions you are. There are some organizations that have very strong norms about what goes into a report, what that report looks like, um, how, it's, how it's formatted and processed, what sort of auxiliary data travels along with the report over its life cycle. And there are some organizations, and I would include RAND in this, where there's much more diversity in what we put out. We have some where we've basically published the entire game and you can go through and, and you know print all the materials and play it yourself. And we have some where it's a four page long report. And that's almost always driven because different sponsors had different requirements on the front end. I'm using that as a concrete example. You see that same level of diversity once you start looking into the archives. I think what we, you know, and this sort of goes back uh, to, to sort of piling on to John's praise for Kara, it really makes you appreciate how important the work of an archivist is in, in pulling all this information together, making it accessible, making a database that's user-friendly, um, making, making there be somebody whose job it is to talk to who can help you navigate this process. Um, I think there's sort of a question of, are we devoting the right level of resources for the government to do that? And what would be the right level of resources, right? There's obvious benefit in being able to look across many games and being able to do this type of comparative analysis. Um, is it enough benefit that you're going to see the types of resources that would be needed to maintain more robust um, you know, information architecture, to have a larger staff that was on full time? And those types of things you could think about really easily as being improvements to the current system um, it would be something I'd actually be really interested in, in hearing Bob work reflect on. Um, I know a lot of, you know, my sense is that a lot of it was really driven by just trying to make the materials more accessible within the building. And so it was a different need case than what we're discussing here that I think drove the original memo. But I'd be, I'd be curious to see what, what his actual impressions are since he was, he was at the core of that work. Yeah, yeah terrific. Um, unless uh, Jackie wants to get in, I'm going to go to the Q&A. Jackie, do you want to make any comments? You know, the only thing I would say is that um, I think something that people don't understand is how expensive it can be to invest in this kind of data. So institutions have to make decisions about um, acquiring information, about actually hiring FOIA lawyers. A lot of the a lot of the uh, wargaming material is hidden behind classified, but doesn't need to be. Um, but that process of declassification, as the DNI recently reported, is extremely cumbersome and very expensive. So there are whole organizations and institutions that are set up trying to FOIA for those games. And then as um, Ellie and John Scott mentioned, then when you're trying to build the database, you have to find some way to build some sort of um, ability to, to um, code <laughs> the data. Um, and, and all of these things are expensive. And that's why there is a really large role for places that are their primary job is preserving the historical record, which is something that we do a lot here at Hoover. Awesome. I'm going to go to the Q&A to get some of our audience questions in here. And I'm going to group them a little bit. Um, we've got some themes. We'll start off with um, a question about adjudication, often called the white cell, right? Where this uh, a participant, uh, an audience member notes, this is a, a great place in which to uh, assumption smuggle, right? And then not have it show up in, in the report. Um, so, uh, you know, in, in my own experience, you can, you can see across archives where 
there is either nothing said about uh, adjudication or in a case where like you're at the MIT archives and nothing was classified in the beginning, you can try and impute something about adjudication because you can see exactly what is going in at the end of a round, and then you can see what is coming out. So you can say, okay, this move was rejected, but asked for, right? And you can see the, the, the role of adjudication, but it takes a little more triangulation. Um, can any of you uh, who, who've been to the archives or, or, or thought about um, seeing adjudication and, and its transparency? Yeah, let us know. Um, uh, John Scott, thanks. Yeah, I, listen, we, uh, this morning, we just had a presentation from Chris Kona uh, from the Naval Undersea Warfare Center talking about adjudication modeling in uh, how to think about undersea warfare, submarine warfare. Uh, and really, the, when you think about, when we think about adjudication, when I think about it, it's to get to a plausible outcome so the players can make subsequent decisions in the game environment. Uh, so uh, understanding that you, we, if, goes into the rules and the assumptions. You have to have an order of battle. You have to have a capability. What time period are you going to play the game? So if it's a, if it's a 1982 war game, they may be using projected capabilities for 1987. Uh, so understanding those types of rules that go into the adjudication. Uh, again, understanding what models may have been put into it. What classification level did they go into that? Were there red players, red experts that were in the adjudication cell? If you just have, uh, in the adjudication stuff, you just have such a matter. If you just have blue players mirror imaging, uh, like uh, John mentioned earlier, uh, that may not. You have to recognize that and be able to identify that. So the adjudication, uh, first, you recognize it as a function to make the game go. Second, as a function to help scope and keep the game on the objectives that the game is, is designed to do. That's how I think about it. So one thing that I think was very useful in looking at the Cold War games at RAND is they were very, very thorough in talking about how they designed their referees and kind of all these adjudication mechanisms. So especially in the social science game, the referees were there to allow for a very free form of play, but also to create conditions of uncertainty, right? So they were there to adjudicate if the move was feasible or not, right? And within the kind of realm of possibility, but they didn't want to limit it too much. What they would often do is that they would leak some information to the other team, right? So sometimes it would be accurate, sometimes it would be inaccurate, sometimes it would be complete and incomplete. So they used that to kind of represent reality as much as possible. They also had the Committee on Special Problems, which involved physicists like Herman Kahn and missileers and others to basically say, can the technology do what you're thinking it's trying to do, right? So bringing in those experts to make sure that you're not projecting futuristic technologies rather than what we currently have. And finally, they had something called the Committee on Nature, which was used to throw in uh, essentially events that were outside of the control of either government. Things like famine, unrest, uh, weather issues, things like that that happen in the real world that you don't tend to think about in game design. So there's a really robust discussion of that um, within these Cold War games. Yeah, maybe one sort of riffing off of that a little bit. I think one of the interesting sort of structural decisions that you see um, in debates about game design more generally, but I think really shapes what the archival materials end up looking like is this distinction between expert adjudication, like what John is describing that was done in the Cold War game, where you have basically a committee of people who are going to make decisions um, sort of on the fly. And you could document that to a certain degree, but at the end of the day, what that room almost always looks like is a bunch of people sitting around under caffeinated, very tired, yelling at each other. And so it's a very messy type of data source that you're going to get under the best circumstances. And there is definitionally a lot of judgment and you're not a lot of time to unpack why that judgment is happening. And so that's gonna give you just kind of inherently messy archival data, even in the best circumstances. You know, if we go to the, the sort of mathematician approach to the gaming, where you did have structured rule sets of if you do this, we're going to follow this mathematical process for determining what the outcome of that choice was. Um, that's a lot easier to, to trace because you can literally see what the process they were using was. If they deviate from the process, it's easier to go back and check it. And so in cases where we do have those rigid rule sets available to us, um, we can do a much more complete accounting. But you know exactly the debate that John was bringing up about why these two games existed um, and why they're still very, 
hotly contested debates in the field about the value of subject matter expert versus rigid form adjudication is because this is an incredibly critical design question that's really gonna shape the type of data that your game generates. And so from an archival perspective, I worry it can be easy to see the rigid rule of form is somehow better or more complete because it's more accessible to outsiders. And that is the benefit of mathematical adjudication, um, but it comes with a lot of drawbacks too. And so I don't think we're ever going to be in a position where that's probably even the dominant form of adjudication um, because of choices that are being made for the original game's purpose. Um, but it is one of those big questions where just like walking into the room, you see what that material looks like and you know a whole bunch of decisions that went in and you can set your expectations about what you're gonna possibly get out, of, out at the back end. Within those structures, there's better and worse ways to document them on the rigid rule side. I think we can learn a lot from modeling and simulation debates that have gone on about how to document those. Um, on the expert side, there's lots on participant observation that I think we can learn about sort of taking good field records under messy conditions that can improve the quality of data capture. Um, so there's more we can be doing, you know, in the present day to build a better re repository going forward. Um, but that casting, I think we need to set those expectations that we're living in different worlds. Terrific. We got a couple questions here about um, computers. Why not just do this all with computer simulation? So I think there's a great quote here um, from one of the mathematical analytics uh, division players, Olaf Helmer, where he, he said that the human participating in the game acts something like an analog computer in the sense that he takes the place of the black box into which his artificial environment feeds certain stimuli to which he reacts behaviorally, behaviorally by producing strategic decisions. Right. So the goal for them was to essentially computerize all of these decisions. They're very explicit. Even in 1954, human judgment is fallible. We want to computerize this. Right. The human we're just treating as if they were a black box. And the problem you get with that and a lot of the dil dilemmas that you see today with kind of AI and things like that is that they're often good on very narrow tasks. Right. And once you expand beyond those tasks, it gets very messy and it can react in ways that you wouldn't necessarily expect, right? So it's just all of the assumptions and all of the issues and messiness that Ellie was talking about, but then you get it on a very kind of deterministic path. And then oftentimes you don't know how you got to the end of that path. Yeah, this is where the Herbert Simon founded rationality just crops up all over the place, right? If you have a problem that is mathematically tractable and you can perfectly build a computer simulation that you think represents the problem well, then yeah, you shouldn't be gaming it. Um, where games really benefit is where you have um, structural uncertainty. We literally don't understand the problem well enough to have been able to build the model before we do the game. And we're using the game basically to put everybody's collective head together and try to shuffle out what we actually think, you know, Let's use our, our underdefined mental models, use the game as a mechanism to make them more explicit, to rub them up against each other, to clarify them, um, and end up with a more, more structured understanding of the problem at the back end. Or we're interested in questions that are fundamentally about the interactions of irrational people bouncing off one another. And so, in fact, what we, in some ways, what we could think about being interested in is the difference between what's the decision a computer would make versus what's the decision a real live person does. And you can see some of this, um, Schelling's work is particularly revealing here, right? Where he's developing game theory and doing war games alongside one another and using them for completely different things, right? I think a lot of people, because his name is associated with both think there's an automatic connection between the two. And he used them in very different ways because in some ways the game theory was distilling patterns of behavior that he saw in the games but the games were also reflecting lots of times people don't actually do what the game theoretic correct answer is. And so it's generating a totally different type of data and they're really complementary to each other. So it's not an either or in the can. If I could, John Scott. Yeah, if yeah. I could add on, I, I, Ellie, I, I think you're right that, you know, if it can be made by a computer, why are you in a war game, right? Because when you think back to the definitions I presented, you know, going to Perlism, it's about the human decision-making. Uh, and so in the game design, game development process, you build the game to, to the point of what decisions will be made by the players who are going to be in the game. And if you can identify that in the archival material, uh, re, uh, Reed, I'm thinking of the, the work you've, you've written about, you know, if you're trying to understand why do they make that decision in the game environment, 
you know, was it a limit to the game environment or was it a, was it an inherent belief they brought into the game or a bias? Um, so the computers are useful for helping understand how the games go and they can help with adjudication. Um, but ultimately, if the decisions are being made by the computer, um, at that point, you're on the mathematical side and you're kind of undermining the whole purpose of the war game, in my mind. Terrific. I, I'm going to draw out another question um, uh, that's a, a theme across a couple of questions about um, team makeup, right? So we've talked about, about group interaction being an interesting uh, outcome that we could study in war games. Um, but some folks are noting that you know, you could you could design the teams in such a way that it would rig the game to come out in a way that you wanted. Right? We could put all the experts on one team and and uh, stack a team with novices. Um, uh, I wonder if you can reflect on on the thinking you do in in your own game designing or in the games you've seen that you haven't designed um, about whether it's possible to see or, and understand how the game how the teams have been designed or whether there are better or worse ways of of uh, deciding the composition of teams. I can, I can start taking a whack at that. Um, so I think your point that it's entirely possible to be unethical in your game design is totally fair. Um, there's a really excellent collection of, of papers reflecting on sort of, you know, if you were to intentionally rig a game, what might you do as a way of developing checks against it that, that the professional community has been doing? Um, so that for the, the question asker, that would be a useful place to look at some of the thinking that's going on in the field. Um, I, th I think some of this comes down to transparency, right? Um, being able to, to make the choices you made clear as clear as possible and why you made them. Mind you, I just spent 15 minutes rattling about why we often don't have it. We have incentives to not do that. So it's not always going to be there. Um, but where possible, I think that's, that's important. I think, you know, from the designer perspective, one thing I try to do in my game reporting is to grapple with the assumption that there will be sources of bias, right? I never get the perfect group of players that I wanted. Um, there's always limitations in terms of the numbers, who exactly was available, the mix of people I might have wanted, the types of experience that were available to me. And to try to think thoughtfully about what the sources of bias um, that that might produce are. So, you know, if I have a red team that maybe is uh, more, more likely to mirror image, what do I think the costs of that mirror imaging are likely to be? How, how would my results be wrong if the team was mirror imaging? Um, how might my results be wrong if I had one team that was more junior than another team? Uh, and so there was inequity between the teams. And trying to think about what those structural advantages might have been and how they're going to impact my research, I think is sort of the best we can do, right? We're never like all other experiments, you're never operating in the perfect conditions. You have to make do with the messiness of the real world. And so trying to be thoughtful about what the consequences of that messiness is, I think is often the best we can do. Thanks, yeah. Ellie. John Scott. Yeah, I, I, would, I would add to that the, uh, the players that you get to come to the game are, are in the end, are the most important. Uh, and you know they come with a bias, and you have to understand where they're coming from. Uh, and so as we... We, we have a bit of a luxury sometimes here in Newport to, to put pressure on to get the right folks from the right O&I, to get the right subject matter experts to come in. And we have uh, what we call repeat offenders, right? So people who know how to play the games here in Newport. Um, you know, Jackie, one of, one of my favorite players to ever come through Newport is Steve Perot. Started as Commander Perot and finished up as, as an admiral. Um, but he's somebody we could trust to come to the game, but we knew where to put him in. And it was a very uh, deliberate placement where he would go in each game set, in each game that he played. Um, and so you have to know your players, understand what you're trying to get out of that game and just work within the bias um, because you're never gonna have a, a completely unbiased. And if you go to the flip side, well, can't you just have the public play those games? Um, well, it depends on the objective of the game. Um, in, in why you want to do that, because you may want to have a, a massive online game to understand some sort of behavior outcome. Uh, again, it it's, the, the, goes to that first question, why are you playing the game? Yeah, I can't help but add a, a couple of reflections here too, just that, um, you know, depending on your research question, it's, it's useful to have teams that are designed differently, right? So, so some people have, have 
noted comparisons between teams of uh, experienced policymakers being more hesitant to escalate versus teams of high school students, you know, uh, using every weapon at their disposal. Um, you know, but you could you could think of doing this in really exciting ways uh, uh, about different types of expertise, right? Um, and and comparing the the way in which teams deliberate um, and and come up with you know quote unquote better or worse solutions. Um, one one aspect of this that relates to um, transparency in the archives that I came across is that in the MIT archives, um, there's a you know on one of the games. Uh, buried deep in a, a thick file with all the, the game moves, uh, there was a, a loose leaf piece of paper that was unsigned, but was clearly written by the note taker, maybe a graduate student in the day, uh, that simply said, um, it would not be an overstatement to say that Walt Rostow was the US team, right? So there was a team, but basically he did, it, it actually said like, he did an estimated 75% of the talking, right? So you could have a team where a single uh, 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 bombastic, you know, uh, uh, larger than life figure and, and clearly hierarchically senior uh, would end up making all the decisions and getting deference, you know, within the team. But you would have no idea going to the archive if that bright young graduate student hadn't written that note for you. So, uh, uh, I just think this is a, a neat opportunity for, for uh, playing around with team makeup, uh, depending on the research question you're trying to get at. And next time in the future sessions, we're gonna talk also about just whether that should be randomized, right? Maybe, not, maybe we need entirely random samples, but if we're not looking for random samples, we want representative samples of elite players, then at least we should randomize those players onto their team. So we'll talk more about that in other sessions as well. Uh, let me get to a question here. That, that is related to this, um, it's about performativity. You, you see in the, in the archives or in the games you have designed and run um, evidence of, of players um, feeling like they are being observed and that they are there to perform a task, right? Rather than actually engage in, in deep strategic thought about the problem uh, at, their, at hand. Uh, so I guess I'll, I'll kick that off. Not as much, given the particular games that I was looking at, right? But simultaneously, like you, I found a kind of unfiled, handwritten note uh, in the Mathematical Analytics Division game, which was essentially, you know, Vietnam appealing to their Soviet Union or to the Soviet Union to help against the imperialist Americans for the food shortage that they were having, right? So you could see that they were playing with it a little bit, right? And they were acting as if they were this kind of communist country that always looked to the Soviet Union, right? Probably wasn't a good representation of things that were going on, right? And so you can kind of see how that plays out in, in this particular game, but acting as if or acting as you think uh, the game designers or referees want you to act is a real problem, especially that I encounter in kind of my teaching and when we do war games in class, right? Are the students just trying to appeal to me? Are they trying to appeal to the others in their group or trying to appeal to someone on the other team? Is always something we grapple with and is fun to observe in the classroom setting. Yeah, um, I guess okay, uh, Ellie, you go in first and then we'll go to John Scott. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, maybe one thing to add on that, I think it's worth thinking about what the incentives are of the players. Why are, why are they in the room? Um, and I think this is a place where there's a real divide between, uh, if you will, professional players, people who are doing this as part of their job and therefore have a totally different set of incentives than if we were to try to recruit players to come participate in a game that we were running um, sort of outside of that professional context, right? It's not that one's better or worse, but they are very different. And so I think um, when we had that conversation about elite samples versus um, sort of broader samples, that's I think that's one piece of that conversation. Um, when it comes to the elite samples that I've spent more time grappling with, yeah, players have agendas, right? And, and so thinking about where is the game plugging into the overarching bureaucratic decision-making who are the players and how do they interact in that broader structure outside of the game is important. If you are designing a game that's going to inform how millions of dollars are spent and you have a player who's from one of the offices that could win or lose on the basis of the game results, 
that is going to steer their, their behavior in some pretty obvious ways. Um, and, and so again, I think it go, comes down to like, the more we can be cognizant of that, um, the more we can try to think carefully about what people's incentives are with the limited data we have, um, that, that's going to be helpful. I will say this is a place where you're least likely to write down what's going on in the room, right? So I, as a game designer, might know some of that contextual detail. Um, I don't think very many game designers are going to be documenting that because it does tend to be um, sensitive in, in meaningful ways. And so that may be a place where, whereas historians, we might want to lean more on interviews and other types of sourcing rather than thinking that the, the archival materials are going to necessarily tell us those sorts of details. Yeah. As an example to, to Ellie's, what Ellie's advocating, um, Jackie, should, I think she'll share the Simsec series they did on the maritime strategy in the 1980s. You get, you get to the sea stories and you hear in the 1980s, the players, admirals were fired based on how they played in the 1981 global war game. Um, and it, 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 so you, it really shapes and changes your view of how you look at them as subjects in your historical data of, you know, these guys' jobs actually mattered. Uh, and so that's, that's one realm of the spectrum to, you know, you're asking a subject matter expert just to come in and, and be a hypothetical person role in, in the game they're playing. Uh, so it's important to capture that. And, and lastly, if you come to Newport and you're on a data collection team for us, we will ask you to sit in the cell and make that observation that uh, Admiral so-and-so was really overbearing. Uh, make that observation so we, we collect that. Uh, or, you know, the cell lead never spoke up. <laughs> you know, you get that type of, uh, of dynamic because you want to capture that. Uh, and it may not go into the report, but it'll be in the game data. That's terrific. Um... So what we're going to do uh, as we're getting to the end here is uh, a little bit of a lightning round, quick, quick answers, uh, single word answers are acceptable. Um, I have a, a series of questions we're going to go through rapidly. Um, and, and we're talking, you know, we've aggregated here across a lot, a lot of different types of games, um, political, military, you, we talk about strategic games versus tactical, operational. Your answers can be from anywhere. Right, so uh, I do think there's a lot of use in just in having these high level uh, uh, cross game type conversations. So question number one is, uh, what is your favorite war game you've ever run, played or come across in the archives? And let's go through, I've got on my screen, uh, John Scott, John and then Ellie. Battle of Jutland. Stage, simulation of to total atomic global exchange. Wow, I have to ask you to say one more thing, what is that? Uh, 1960s computerized war game that definitively found that the U.S. would win in a total global nuclear war. Ah, fantastic. Now John's making me feel bad because I'm going to say SAFE, and I don't remember what the acronym fully stands for, uh, but it was a 60s RAND uh, game that was looking at nuclear force posture. Terrific. Who is your favorite war gamer? And it doesn't have to be specific person, although we did hear one already from John Scott. And if you want to just restate that, that's fine. But it could also be a caricature, right? A type of war gamer that you come across. Your favorite, John Scott. Oh, my favorite war gamer right now is Sebastian Bay. He's our, he's our, he is our, uh, our John out in the wilderness telling us what's going on. That's great. Love Sebastian Bay. Wonderful. Uh, mine, even though I disagree with him, Olaf Helmer. From Rand in the 50s. Uh, I'm gonna go with Bernice Brown. All right, related. Who does wargaming best? And it's it's fair if you say the institution from which you come. Depends. Yeah. Uh, of course, the War College for Operational, Halsey for Tactical, um, NPS for Teaching Educational. Great. And I'll say Rand just so Ellie doesn't have to say it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but now you took my answer. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I'm going to do total cop out. I actually think there's a lot of really great work going on um, in a lot of really diverse places. And one of the things that's nice about the gaming community is that it's in general not particularly cutthroat. And so there are definitely things where we will say, yeah, Newport does a better job than we do at this, or CNA does a better job than we do at this. Um, and I think that's, that's actually really important and healthy. Awesome. Excellent. Um, in your opinion, are war games used enough, not enough, or too much in decision making? Probably not enough. I'll say too much at the lower level, not enough at the highest levels, and broadly, yes, but of the wrong kind of war gaming. Yeah, I think we need way more bureaucratic and policy gaming and way less war fighting gaming. 
Fantastic. Each of these could be its own webinar. So we're just teeing up lots of discussions for the future. Next one, true or false, the larger the N, the better. False. 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 Fantastic. Okay, we have some consensus. <laughs> Uh, perhaps not across webinars, but we'll know that was the outcome of this webinar. Great. Uh, all right. Very last question. Dice or no dice? Yes. No. Both? Both. All right. Excellent. Both. Both. Okay. Thank you very much to our, our three panelists, our wonderful guests for today. We'll give you a virtual round of applause. And uh, just as we end, I'm going to hand the mic over to Eric Lynn Greenberg to tee up our next session. Thank you very much. That was awesome. I, I definitely learned a ton. I think this week's conversation has really set us up for next week. Where we're going to pivot from looking at historical and archival games uh, to learning a little bit about how researchers are thinking about running their own games as synthetic data generating processes. Uh, so same time uh, next Wednesday, and we hope uh, you all join us then. Thanks again. Take care, y'all.